Our New Testament lesson and the text for our sermon comes from the Gospel according to Luke, the 6th chapter, verses 27 through 36. Luke 6, 27 through 36. Listen to the word of God. Jesus said, But I say to you that, listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you, if anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies, do good, and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. It would be a mixed marriage. The thought sent a shudder through Sue. But she reminded herself other people had done it. She had read about couples who brought the same differences to their marriage and had survived, even prospered. Plus, in her defense, Bill had sort of tricked her. They met in Columbia, both enrolling at the University of South Carolina School of Law. Serendipitously seated next to each other in contracts class, they joined the same study group. It had taken off from there. Class, coffee, library, rendezvous, and then on November the 10th, Bill pulled a ring out of his pocket as they sat on the hand-me-down couch in his apartment. Being with him was what she really wanted. I mean, she truly loved him. Of course, the first order of business was where they would spend Thanksgiving. He agreed to go to her house in Rock Hill on Thursday as long as they could be back in Columbia at his parents by Saturday because his dad knew someone who knew someone and he had procured tickets for the Clemson, South Carolina game. Sue was ecstatic. She loved football. That Saturday morning in his house felt just right. She liked his parents. They were so welcoming and fun. She bounded down the stairs, clad in garnet and black, ready to do battle against the evil orange empire. And there was Bill waiting for her in the kitchen with a Clemson shirt on. Immediately, she looked for nasty writing on the shirt, something that would signify that the shirt was a joke, but it had to be legitimate because he also had on a with a big orange tiger paw and an orange jacket and orange shoes. He resembled that crazy Clemson fan who always wears that orange tuxedo to games. She thought Trey DeBose was his name. She felt so silly now. She had never thought to ask where he went to college. He grew up in Columbia, was attending the South Carolina Law School. How could he not have gone to USC? Of course, looking back, that was the first shock. She had recovered from that Saturday, slowly. Though Clemson won that day, he was smart enough not to gloat, at least to her. But then Christmas had quickly come around, and being newly engaged, that meant meeting the rest of the family. For the first on the list was his uncle, Jim Thompson, or rather, Dr. Jim Thompson. He was a professor at Presbyterian College, and for some reason, he felt the need to explain that not only did he teach at Presbyterian, but he was a Presbyterian. As a good Baptist, Sue didn't really know what that meant or why you would want to belong to a church that was so hard to spell. But that wasn't the weird part. He was a Democrat. She had never met a Democrat. Her grandmother had told her that when she was a little girl, she had known quite a few, but in South Carolina, they were almost extinct. 
In fact, as the uncle made his political leanings known, his sister, chairwoman of the Republican Party in Union County, suggested he and his kind should be placed on the endangered species list. Well, just as the uncle began his gun control speech, Bill steered her out the back door for some air, only to be confronted by two of the cousins soaked in blood. They were gutting the deer they shot while discussing what handgun they could buy the gun control uncle for Christmas. Everyone in Sue's family were fishermen. Looking at the deer, all she could think was that they had shot Bambi. From there, it only cascaded. Cousin Fred showed up with his ankle bracelet as he explained it a misunderstanding between him and law enforcement. Anne Elaine waltzed in with her 25-year younger boyfriend. Apparently, instead of holding down jobs, Elaine had made a career of holding down husbands. Then there was Cousin Fred, Ivy League education, tweed jacket, khaki pants, still living with his mother. Yet there were also a lot of normal people present, depending on how you define normal. When we get married, most of us envision being tied forever to our wonderful person. Usually, only later, do we realize we have not only married a person, but an entire family. And the same holds true for our Christian faith. When we become followers of Jesus, his family, his friends, his buddies also become a part of our spiritual family. Peter's story in his book, Listening at Golgotha, Jesus' Words from the Cross, writes, Some tell us that following Jesus is a simple matter of inviting him into our hearts. But when we do that, Jesus always asks, may I bring my friends? And when we look at them, we see that they are not the kind of company we would like to keep. The friends of Jesus are the outcasts, the marginalized, the poor, the homeless, the rejected, the lepers of life. We hesitate and ask, Jesus, must we really have them too? And Jesus replies, love me, love my friends. This morning, I want to look at Jesus' friends, his buddies, and ask what that means for you and me. Now, before I begin, I want to first make a suggestion. Sometime this week, sit down and read straight through the gospel according to Mark. It won't take that long. It's the shortest and earliest of the four gospels. And just watch what Jesus does and with whom he does it you will see that they correspond to my first part, that Jesus' friends were not perfect by a long shot. Right at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, in the second chapter of Mark, the Pharisees complained to Jesus' disciples with the question, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Now, this is an important question, because in the eyes of religious people, this was a powerful denunciation. These meals were not business lunches. In the Middle East, partaking of a meal together signified the desire for a relationship, a friendship. Jesus was going out of his way to befriend the very people the faithful wanted to avoid. But there is not only a theological statement here, but a political one. Tax collectors were the most reviled members of the community. By purchasing a tax district, they were free to charge whatever they desired as long as they returned a set amount to Roman government officials. They cheated people, exacting unfair amounts of tax money. Consequently, if you wanted to start a business, get married, buy a house, move to Jerusalem, pay off a debt, likely your plans, hopes, and dreams had been thwarted by a tax collector. Plus, not only economically, but politically, they collaborated with the cruel, pagan, conquering Romans. The Romans had brought false gods into the Holy Land. Their hated soldiers patrolled the streets. A tax collector was part of the machinery that enabled the Romans to maintain their grip on the country of Israel. God's country and God's people. And Jesus ate with them, befriended them. But 
Jesus didn't stop with the economic and political degenerates. When it says tax collectors and sinners, sinners means people like prostitutes. Otherwise, he was having a meal with people that no one else would touch with a 10-foot pole. We're not talking about people who didn't make it to the synagogue every Friday night. These were individuals who were viewed as harming other people economically, politically, morally, and spiritually. Some of you may know of the comedian Jeff Foxworthy. He's been on television numerous times, and he is known for his comedy routine, routine that has a number of one-liners that begins with, you may be a redneck if. Well, one time he noted that if you ever start feeling like you have the goofiest, craziest, most dysfunctional family in the world, all you have to do is go to a state fair. He says, because at five minutes at the fair, you'll be going, you know, we're, we're all right. We're dang near royalty. Well, Jesus looked like he was gathering up everybody from the state fair. Second, those befriended by Jesus not only did not model a godly lifestyle, but often they never changed that lifestyle. Most of us carry this vision that anyone who came into the presence of Jesus would be instantly changed, their life transformed. But the Gospels show us that was not true. In Mark 10, the man we often call the rich young ruler comes to Jesus and asks what he must do to inherit eternal life. Jesus tells him to obey the commandments, and the man says, I have kept all of these since my youth. And verse 21 states, Jesus, looking at him, loved him. You only lack one thing, Jesus tells him. Sell everything you own, give the money to the poor, and come follow me. But he went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Jesus loved him, offered him an opportunity to be with him, which meant he had the chance to constantly be in the presence of God. But choosing between God and money, he chose money. Judas Iscariot travels with Jesus for three years. As a disciple, he obtains the privilege to watch Jesus heal people, listen to every sermon and parable, spend every waking moment feeling the power of God around him. And in the end, he betrays Jesus to the religious authorities for 30 pieces of silver. In Luke 17, Jesus heals 10 lepers. The most feared disease in the ancient world, it disfigured a person's body, forcing them into social isolation. It was a death sentence, both physically and socially. Yet when Jesus heals them, frees them of certain death, only one returns to thank him. When Jesus made friends, there was no guarantee those friends would change for the better. Jesus chose to befriend them, but they chose what to do with that friendship. William Sloan Coffin was a well-known preacher. He was chaplain at Yale University and went on to become the senior minister at Riverside, the Riverside Church in New York City. One day a man approached him complaining that religion was just a crutch. And Coffin replied, what makes you think you don't have a limp? Some people chose not to follow Jesus because they didn't think they had a limp. Third, some of Jesus' friends do not change for the better, but some do. 
Zacchaeus, the despised tax collector, finds his life transformed by his contact with Jesus. Half my possessions I will give to the poor, and anyone I have defrauded I will pay four times the amount. Brash talking, egotistically opinionated Peter vows he will never forsake Jesus, and then turns around and cowardly denies Christ three times, three times during Jesus' most desperate time, but transformed. By Jesus' resurrection, Peter becomes a powerful and fearless preacher and one of the leaders of the early church. The Apostle Paul, in charge of discovering and eliminating Christians, watches as Stephen, the first Christian martyr, is stoned to death. Yet after encountering Christ on the Damascus Road, he becomes Christianity's most successful missionary and writes the majority of the books of the New Testament. Some of Jesus' friends despite their cowardly or wicked past, are transformed by the love and forgiveness of Jesus. Stefani, Joanna, Angelina, German Ota must have thought her name did not project the right image, so she became Lady Gaga. Izuv Danielovich Dembski transformed into Kurt Douglas. Eric Marlin Bishop became Jamie Foxx. Francis Gum decided to be Judy Garland. Audrey Perry changed into Faith Hill. Robin Fence morphed into Rihanna. And Marion Morrison, unsure anyone would pay to see him in the movies, decided to become John Wayne. This mirrors transformations in the Bible. When Jacob becomes Israel, Saul changes into Paul, and Simon takes the name Peter. In the church, we may not change our names, but we transform everything else. We believe, accept, and live the love and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. Now, what do Jesus' friendship choices mean for us here at Westminster? The church, this church, is to be a place of refuge. Here's where men and women are offered the opportunity for a fresh start. Everyone is welcome here. No sin is too great, no past too checkered for a person not to be welcomed and made a part of this community of faith. Like Jesus, we open our arms to every person who seeks to be a member of the body of Christ. We befriend every individual who comes through that door. In this place, everyone gets to begin again, start fresh and clean. And we do that because we know Jesus can change lives. We know that because he has changed ours. Though their sins may be different from ours, other people are just fellow sinners. Just as Jesus has forgiven, accepted, and befriended me, I forgive, accept, and befriend others. John Vanier is the founder of the Larch Communities, which provide a loving home for people with severe mental disabilities. In his book, From Brokenness to Community, he tells about a man named Peter. He writes, when somebody asked one of our men, Peter, if he liked to pray, he said that he did. So the person continued and asked him what he did when he prayed. He replied, I listen. Then the person asked what God says to him. And Peter, a man with Down syndrome, looked up and says, he just says, you are my beloved son. Vanier concludes, when someone has lived most of his or her life in last place, 
and then discovers that Jesus is there in the last place as well, it is truly good news. Our sin puts all of us in the last place. The church reminds us that not only is Jesus down there with us, but so is everyone else. Jesus' buddies. Frankly, it astonishes us the people Jesus befriended. Yet those examples defy our, define our duty and mission. As Jesus noted when confronted with the fact that he ate with sinners and tax collectors, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Westminster Presbyterian Church is a hospital for sinners. That is how you and I got here and why we welcome and befriend everyone else.